So this was a random eBay impulse buy that I got a little while ago. In its heyday, it might have been used at perhaps a television station to calibrate equipment. So you have composite video coming out over a BNC jack. Then you have stereo audio coming out over XLRs. And then on the back, you can see the little Tektronix badge. And if you open this door, you can see I've already populated this with some modern batteries. It takes eight double A's. So if you power this on, it tells us it's from 1994 and that it's traveled many years into the future to greet us. And immediately it goes into whatever mode you had it last in. So in this case, it was generating some color bars. But as you can see, there are a lot of different patterns. I'm just pressing different buttons down here. Oh, geez, that's a center negative jack. That sure is a sign of a bygone era that I am happy to leave in the past. So the only obvious audio feature here is this tone generator. I wonder if that's all we have uh, audio-wise. And then this alphanumeric keypad seems to exist mostly for customizing these text overlays. So let's get this hooked up and see what the output looks like. There we go. Some classic NTSC color bars. So I think many of these are tests designed to look for specific problems that would exist in analog televisions or just analog signal transmission in general. So like some of these look like, like this looks like, oh, it's increasing frequencies so that you would detect problems that show up at specific frequencies. I don't know what this one was for, the kind of a weird like brightly colored band. Maybe it's looking for some type of color bleed. Some really interesting stuff. NTC7 might be some standard. But I thought it would also be fun to take a look at these on an analog television to see if we can see some of the artifacts that maybe these tests would be designed to, uh, to try to highlight. We edit the station ID. Is there anything else obvious that we can do with it? So we can turn the ID on and off. We just did this thing where we edited the ID. What, is the, what does a two line ID look like? That looks terrible. I, I was kind of expecting it to center it, but I guess there's a separate thing for ID position. Yeah. I guess you can just put it wherever you want. That's handy. Well, kind of. That's the minimum horizontal position. This is probably going to have a pretty interesting old school text generation chip in it. Oh, is it putting that in the vertical blanking? I think live should be between pink and red. Can I recall, is there anything saved in here? Handheld, TSG95. Those probably are some factory stuff or stuff that the previous owner set. I don't see anything else. All these are just characters. We have this lockout key, which just locks out everything else. So if you press something else, then it gives you an error message. So that's probably what you would do if you just wanted to have this thing hang out in an equipment rack, generating something like this all day. That one's kind of nice too. Okay, let's try this on an analog television. So this test is actually named NTSC Bounce. And it at first looks like it's just switching between a black background and a white background. The text moves in and out just a little bit as the background changes color. And I think that's measuring a voltage bounce in one of the power supplies. Oh, and Tech Constantin in chat had a really nice real-time answer for my question about what the, uh, what the kind of bounce test was actually doing. And they're saying, that the size change is mostly the anode voltage dropping. The deflection doesn't change. Um, the picture gets bigger with more intensity because the lower anode voltage causes the electrons to fly slower, therefore they'll get deflected more. That's neat. You might be able to see some subtle colors on these vertical bands, yellows and blues. I assume this TV just doesn't separate the color signal quite as well as the digitizer we were just using. This one looks about the same. So oh, that's the tone generator. There's a tone menu where you can set the frequency. I think you can set the amplitude. Oh, that's juicy. 
So I'm just triggering on a particular line pretty early on in the video, like right after vertical blanking or so. Like this is a pretty good demonstration of how NTSC encoding works. This is a, a five step grayscale pattern and it's just going to increase DC levels without any modulation on top of that. The phase of the actual line data relative to the color burst matters, but the phase of the actual signal can change line to line. So I think that's what we're seeing here. So yeah, it's hard to see what's going on here since the phase changes a lot globally and we're not looking at the relative phase here. I mean, you can see that something is changing every time the color bar changes color, but it's kind of hard to see what's actually going on. This is the sine x over x. That's right what it says on the tin. It's a pretty good looking waveform. This is a sweep. So that's the black box that the text is surrounded by. The text is uh, coming out of somebody's shift register. I bet we're gonna find a bunch of different analog circuits that generate these different patterns. I, I don't think it's gonna be just a big old D to A converter. So it seems like this thing knows how to make tones, bars, and text. Let's open this thing up next and see what kind of hardware they use to accomplish that. It's feeling a little bit warm already. I can't tell quite where that's coming from. Looks like there is space for a proprietary rechargeable pack as well as eight double A's. Ooh, there's a bunch of wires. Already this is super annoying to get into. We have the battery and everything else on the back shell of the instrument here, just attached with these plug-in connectors. So these two are pretty clearly just the audio outputs. This one seems to be the power inputs. So it has two pins for the rechargeable pack and two pins for the AA string. And then this one is the composite video output. Oh, this is looking pretty nice. So this looks like a calibrated oscillator, 27 megahertz. Set plus seven hertz, it says. Several labeled trimmers here. Offset, Sinex. That looks like a fancy op amp. What is that, OPA 603? So that's the audio outputs, those two. That's the video output. What is that? So I just searched for the marking on that big national semi-chip and down here, service manual. Oh, here's what we were just looking at on the O-scope. I wonder if you could program this to do games kind of like an Atari, Atari 2600. This is a lot nicer than what I was expecting. Also makes me really curious what you could do if you changed the contents of this EE prom. Wow, schematic. That's beautiful. 78C10. The second biggest chip is this NEC microcontroller. Interesting, I wonder what MAME devices use this. Oh, interesting, it looks like this is a relative of a chip that somebody decided to hack for fun in their drum machine. Yeah, so it looks like MAME has a disassembler for this architecture. There aren't really a lot of tools coming up. The service manual is pretty nice though. Digital timing control, which I guess is their ASIC. ADG313. Signal segment memory segment address memory. Maybe we can probe some of this stuff on the O-scope and take a look at these memory banks as they're being used. So there's this wire going down under. Is it possible this has a backlight? That plug is definitely a backlight. I didn't see how to activate the backlight. That must have been some something else in software. All right. Couldn't tell whether it was possible to get this out with the keyboard board, but it seems like it wanted to unplug, so I was gonna help it unplug. So the other side is utterly boring. That is mundane, but beautiful. Some little buttons there. Nice little latch to hold the LCD down. Little piece of rubber. So this is pretty interesting. It has a ASIC, it has an 8-bit CPU, it has a DAC, pretty nice filtering on that DAC. You can make a pretty, pretty nice retro arcade console out of this, perhaps. It would just likely have Atari 2600 style graphics, if that, since I don't think this is going to have like sprite logic like the Atari did. Pretty classic little two line display here. This construction detail is kind of interesting. Can't recall actually seeing this done before. So the LCD attaches with these long pins that actually pass through this connector, but they enter on the solder side and actually pass just right next to the solder tails. 
So the pins actually go right through there and then they press through. That's pretty weird. So we have one memory that's accessible by both the microcontroller and the ASIC, then two memories that are connected just to the ASIC. This one's labeled signal segment memory, and this one's the signal segment address memory. So this might be a settings EEPROM. Either way, that's two kilobytes connected to the microcontroller. So output drivers for the audio, muting transistors, and then this looks like a plain old audio codec, like a digital in analog out kind of thing. Let's see if that's correct. Oh, no it isn't. This is a programmable sine wave generator, so it doesn't have arbitrary audio output. But internally it has a D to A converter, it connects it directly to a lookup table. Okay, that's the audio chip. That is a sine wave generator. U14, the MB40760. That is our main D to A converter for the test signal. So there's a trimmer for gain. Maybe also this FET is for gain. A lot of options for filtering this that they gave themselves. So then we have an offset for the output amplifier that comes again from the same two and a half volt reference that we saw down here in the audio circuit. Gain calibration is just with this passive network here. This will affect the feedback path of the op amp. I just don't know what they're doing with that. It's some kind of compensation in the output amplifier. And this is their NICAD charger circuit. A little, a little current limiter, I think. Program memory is stored in the ROM, U24. The ROM is accessed with the help of the ASIC. So the ASIC is doing the memory mapping here. Well, that might mean that if we did want to hack on this, an early step that would help a lot and would let you actually write code for this would be to have an EEPROM emulator for this chip. Like, for just hacking around on this thing, it would be pretty interesting to, to kind of interpose on this bus a little bit. This stuff runs on plus and minus five. How does it get that? So this is a chip designed as a regular buck regulator, but it looks like here they're using it to convert 12 volts to plus and minus five. This is going to be, so like the left half of this transformer is like a pretty normal five volt buck converter going from 12 volts down to five volts. So if you ignore the right half of this transformer and just assume this is a regular inductor, that looks pretty normal so far. But then if you look at the other side, I think they're using that same magnetic flux coupled to this other inductor, but in the opposite direction to just generate a, I think this is a, going to end up being an unregulated roughly minus five volt supply since it's going to be regulated through the feedback on the plus five supply. But then if you're drawing about the same amount of current, then this will end up being about minus five volts. Under normal operation, it's a little under my quarter amp limit. It's the most significant bit of the DAC. Hmm. Yeah, so there's all the bits coming right out of the, out of the ASIC. Let's get my curiosity about the ROM out of the way. I kinda wanna probe the ROM first. Let's just look at the addressing on the ROM and see if it's at all synchronized with this. That'll tell us whether the CPU has to stop running during the video generation or anything like that. It looks like it's not doing much and the not much that it is doing is unsynchronized with the video. What? That can't be right, really? Who would design something like that? There we go, there's the CPU clock. 13.51 megahertz. And delightfully, it's totally synchronized with the video since they're all coming from the same oscillator. Yeah, so what about the, what, what about the signal segment address memory? That's U7, 27CO20, this says two megabit. Just probing each bit of the data bus coming out of this EEPROM. I think this is gonna be the least significant bit of the address. Text doesn't seem to affect the addressing going into here. This is looking counter-like. That state where it's not really changing much seems to be high for a while, and then it goes low. Like maybe that burst of activity is the ASIC reading a bunch of things from this EEPROM, and then it just happens to be left at whatever the last address was. All right, let's try a different memory. Getting a little bit of a picture of what's going on, but it's still kind of fuzzy. We could actually cheat and just read more of the surface manual too. There's some inputs on here that look like they're not being used, like maybe they were for debugging. This is a RAM, 32K. That's one of the data pins on the RAM. So this is one of the lines of our color bar plus text overlay. Yeah, we might not see the loading happening during the text. It looks like there's a bunch of stuff that gets loaded by the ASIC during the horizontal blanking. I mean, it would be interesting to do something cool with this device involving reprogramming it. This person wrote a disassembler. It would be interesting just to pull these chips out and read the code off of them, although 
I don't have a parallel EEPROM reader. It's drawing about two watts. That warm spot right there is the output op amp. That's the linear regulator chip. That's the ASIC, in particular the part of it right next to the RAM. And the RAM itself is a little warm. D to A converter and another op amp. Microcontroller runs pretty cool. Maybe C4, maybe 94. I don't know, I, th I thought the firmware said 1994. Yeah, I'll have to figure out what to do with this. I, I have a feeling that Epic software hacking is not necessarily going to be worth the effort. Just using this as part of my video setup seems pretty interesting. Oh, there is a backlight. It's just super dim. Off, on, off, on. Yeah, it has a backlight. Well, I hope you enjoyed this little random hardware teardown. It definitely surprised me. I was expecting something with a little bit more old school analog circuitry in it. And so it was surprisingly modern in some ways, but still kind of an old enough digital circuit to be a little bit annoying to hack around on any further. But it's still a pretty interesting little piece of kit and I hope I find some way to use it in my little television studio here. Anyway, thanks for tuning in and a special thanks to all my patrons who keep the lights on in the shop and make all of this possible. Help my cat keep getting his food. Help me keep getting my hacks. So thanks again, and I will see you all later on the next videos, on the internet, on Twitter, and everywhere else hacks appear. Mm.